Greetings, and bienvenue, mine crew. Thank you for returning to this broadcast. And welcome to new viewers joining us for the first time. If you like a video, then feel free to subscribe. I'm kind of drunk and phone posting, but if you're interested, I can post a story about a creature I saw in a lake in northern Ontario as a boy. Okay, I'm awake and not too hungover and Thread isn't dead. It's not some amazing story, but it's interesting because it makes me wonder about what's out there. The about 10 or 12 very outdoors kids love exploring, being in woods, etc. Mom takes me and my sister grandpa's up north in Ontario. Excited, don't see grandpa ever as he and mom aren't close but he's literally a flannel shirt, fishing hat stereotypical grandpa. Lives far enough out he is in the portaging area. If you don't know, Canada basically became a country from fur trappers landing on the east coast traveling to Ontario for the beavers and trapping them. They soon realized it was much faster to carry the canoes from lake to lake, rather than just walking around them. So many lakes existed they didn't even bother naming them all. Grandpa lives in an area like this, lakes every couple kilometers. Most of them not named or mapped. Ten-year-old's paradise. I fish, I swim, and generally good times are hard. One day Gramps takes me out on a boat and we don't catch shit. Gramps calls it and takes us in but young enthusiastic me doesn't want to call it. Ask him to fish off the dock, says it's fine but I won't get anything off his dock. Walks me to the edge of the property and shows me a trail. Says it's only 20 minutes to the lake that has a nice little dock and is quieter as no one lives on the lake. So I might get something other than sunfish. Give me a couple worms and off I go. Get to lake, deserted, nice enough little narrow dock for me to fish off. So I do so. I don't remember how long I fished but it couldn't have been very long. Looking out into the middle of the lake just relaxing, not catching shit. Everything is perfectly still. I must have not moved in a couple minutes. When I notice a movement, maybe 30 meters out from the dock and to the left, an absurdly large fish has lazily surfaced and is still moving forward directly into my view. All of this happens in less than a second, but as my brain and eyes catch up I get a good look at this thing. It is very long maybe six feet and it has four short stocky appendages. It moves through the water like a snake but very relaxed and rolls onto its side at which point it must see me. It gives an almost annoyed more aggressive flick of its tail and shoots forward at blinding speed. So fast it almost looked like it disappeared but I see it disappear to my right and it obviously swam off. But the way it looked at me for that split second it looked smart, like it didn't want me to see it. I know what you're thinking this is the part of the story where I realize it's fake but hear me out. Is it so crazy for a larger organism with near hypersensitive perception to exist? Many times I have been walking through the woods to a fishing spot or body of water. I am a backpacking fisherman. Something I have learned is you need to sneak up to the water's edge. The amount of times I've come up to some water and heard a fish of large size get spooked and swim off while I'm still around the corner. Not in sight is countless. And I walk lightly yet somehow they know I'm there. This is just lake trout and shit as well. Have you ever spotted a beaver? Or a bobcat? Imagine a bobcat in the water, you would never see one. It sounds fucking crazy but I think I saw some type of advanced species of otter. I didn't get that into what it looked like but here I go. About six feet, half of which is the tail. Four short stumpy legs tucked into the body while it propelled with its tail. Appeared webbed but not sure. The legs in proportion to the body remind me of a stereotypical wiener dog, almost comically short. Dark brown fur covers its body, the same murky shade as the bottom of a lake. Its skull was arrowhead shaped almost like a snake. The creature itself moved like a snake, but really any aquatic animal that length swims their way and I do not believe it to have been reptilian. After seeing this I immediately knew something was wrong with that. Run back to grandpa's and tell him. Seems kinda like lol I dunno kid it was probably an otter. Dude what it wasn't. Hands me a big book from a shelf, basically an encyclopedia of all animals in North America. Specifically Canada. Pour over this book for the next week and find nothing. I want to believe it truly was an undiscovered species in the middle of nowhere. Pick sorta of related to a picture of an Ontario lake I took a few weeks ago in the middle of nowhere. Not the same are though. But that's the story, no skinwalkers and spooks, it didn't attack me, I never saw it again. But this is a 100% true story, and I know what I saw. No, it wasn't a lake otter and no it wasn't a fucking sturgeon on so don't even ask. I believe you, just two years ago they described the reticulated siren, a two-foot-long salamander, because of its habitat being very hard to study. 
You should go back up there and see if you can spot it again. I googled that siren and that's really cool and relevant to what I meant. It had only been discovered in three localities. Two feet long as well and right under everyone's noses. I don't think going back and searching for years would yield results, maybe if I had scuba gear. That's what I meant when I was talking about the fish. If a dumb fish can prevent me from seeing it, imagine a much smarter advanced animal. I think I got really lucky that day because I was standing on the dock perfectly still not catching anything and zoned out. My lack of movement and noise and being in the right place at the right time. Lake Lanier. This rather eerie history and the spooky presence of whole underwater ghost towns, derelict ghost ships, and desecrated cemeteries are far from the only strange things about Lake Lanier. And indeed it has accrued a rather sinister reputation for drawing death and suffering to itself. Over the years, there have been an inordinate amount of deaths associated with the lake ranging from boating accidents, drownings, and even a fair number of drivers who have lost control of their vehicles to go careening off of roads to crash into the water. There are various stories of boats hitting something in the water only for it to turn out there was nothing there, boats or other watercraft capsizing for no apparent reason, and sudden, dangerous rogue waves that seem to come from nowhere without warning to maraud across the surface. Many of the drowning cases are somewhat odd in that they have happened very close to shore with strong swimmers and in calm conditions, which considering the history of the lake have given rise to rumors that Lake Lanier is somehow haunted or cursed. Some who have almost drowned here and lived to tell the tale have told a feeling as if they were being pulled underwater or held under by unseen hands, or of having the air suddenly seem to leave their lungs and cause exhaustion with startling suddenness. This happened this summer in northern Ontario, Canada near the town of Perry Sound. My friend and I had headed up north to spend some time up at my granddad's cabin he shares with a few other hunters that was next to a very long lake. You need to take a boat to get to the cabin. I had gone up there a few weeks prior just to wander around and help my dad with some repairs. Improvements he was making to the cabin. While I was there, I looked at a printout of a satellite map they had in the camp of the area. There was no Wi-Fi in the cabin. And it was sort of in a valley and it was very hard to get any sort of signal and I noticed that there was a small lake north of the one we were at, and there was a small island inside of the lake. Me and my dad took the boat to the area and found a nice pristine little island. We didn't go on it, only looked at it in a nice lake with some swampy areas, and a small fiberglass boat the hunters used to hunt ducks in the lake sometimes near to the right of where we were. The lake was much higher than the one we came from and it would have been impossible for us to take the boat we came in up the hill to the lake. Me and my friend headed back to explore the island. We headed up the hill, and noticed there was a small gorge that led into the lake. It used to be a river but was blocked up by a beaver dam. My friend and I started to walk through it, and I started to feel uneasy simply because of the increase of bugs in the gorge, and being slightly afraid of running into a beaver pissed, off due to us being close to its home. Turns out too my friend was feeling the same feeling, but he couldn't figure out why. He just felt that there was something weird about the lake. We left the gorge and made our way up to the top of the hill where the lake greeted us. We overturned the boat, and after a few failed attempts of trying to launch the boat, we made it to the lake. Now I must say that I am almost 6 feet 4 and my friend is around 5 feet 7. So trying to fit us in the tiny boat, plus our bags made it a bit challenging. Along with there being only one oar. We planned on bringing two, but thought one would have been good enough. We made our way to the middle of the lake, aiming for the island, with my friend rowing the boat. He had more experience rowing with one oar than I did. We both were feeling uneasy but I just put mine off to one, being in a small boat that could tip over if one of us sneezed, and two, being almost an hour from any town or hospital. So we were both kind of worried about getting hurt, stranded but at this time, we were feeling okay. Until the boat stopped moving, we were in the middle of the lake, with a small map with a rock face around 20 feet away from our left, and woods to the right. We could see the water around us moving, the wind creating a slight wave. We carefully looked below us to see if we had hit a sandbar but we didn't see any sand beneath us, only just the dark black waters of the lake. We put the oar in the water and didn't feel any current. We found though that we could move to the left and the right, but just not forward almost like we had hit an invisible wall in a video game. We both felt the boat start to sink down, almost like it was being sucked into the lake. 
my friend started to row to the right. And we made our way to the right, then once near the coast, we made it to the island. From far away the island seemed to be nice and pristine, but once we got close, we saw that it seemed desolate. The trees were dead, dying. And the island was covered in stone, pine needles, and dead lichen, with swamp and decay covering the lake. We tied the boat to a sturdy, although dead pine tree, and spent some time on the island, checking it out, and looking for anything of interest. After spending some time on the island, and running out of bug spray we decided to head back to the cabin. My friend took the oar, and started to prod the water around the island to find a good place to portage out of. Around this time both me and him started to feel a grave sense of unease. Personally, it felt like a feeling of pure dread, sort of like the feeling of when you get a test you failed back mixed with every instinct in my body saying get out of here, you're gonna fucking die if you stay. We heard some commotion in the water, and looked and saw around 10 feet away from us we saw some geese run into the water, and right where they came from, we saw what looked like a black shape scuttle. Crawl behind some rocks, kinda like a mix of, I guess the closest thing I can think of would be of in Star Wars when the Jawas go behind the rocks. My friend also said he heard a strange noise but I didn't notice it. We also had noticed too that the lake had gotten awfully still, and that the forest had fallen quiet. We found a good place to portage from and we decided that I would row back. As we headed our way back I looked from where we started from and saw a strange black, stick-like figure standing from where we left. At this point I didn't want to point it out, so I just kept rowing. I would row for around 7 minutes, then take a short break. But whenever we would take a break, we could hear the crunching of leaves and breaking of branches following us in the woods. I hugged the coast as we headed back, even when staying around 12 feet away from the shore. I couldn't see the bottom of the lake. We eventually got back and put the boat back where we found it. When we tipped it over, we noticed that there were scratch marks all over the bottom of the boat that looked like something had tried to claw it. As we started to leave, we decided to take one last look at the beaver dam, where we soon noticed there was a cave behind the dam. Upon seeing this, we decided to GTFO. We made our way back to the main lake, where we walkie-talkie to my granddad to come and pick us up. He was with some hunting buddies that day. On another note I forgot to add. We tried to walkie him on the island, but couldn't get any signal. As we left I looked back, and saw the figure standing on the island later that night too. As me and my friend were at a fire pit next to the cabin, we started to hear strange noises coming from the woods, almost like a person trying to make the hoot sounds of an owl. Although this could have just been my granddad's hunting buddies in the cabin. But yeah that's the gist of the story. The land itself used to be native and I'm just wondering if anyone has any sort of guess as to what me and my friend saw. Just to sum it up I guess. Boat stopping mysteriously. Sense of dread. Weird black figures. Weird noises similar to static. Scream on island and strange hooting at the cabin. Be me, Anon. Twelve-ish at night. Friends and chick he was hooking up with wanted to sneak into the lake and swim in dirty ass water. Hypochondriac Anon says EW no, but then says I'll just sit by the dock and just chill on my phone. We sneak in and friends are swimming around and sneaking onto slides for about 20 minutes while I chill on the dock. Pick related to location. I was sitting alone on my phone, then something in my gut says Anon turn around now. A coyote is one thing. But this was not. It was hairless and looked like a fucking reverse limbed dog man or something. I really can't describe it. Red fucking eyes reflecting off of whatever light there fucking was. I feel true fear for the first time. Dizzy with tunnel vision and nauseated. Just remember standing up and backing near the water in case this thing charged me. It just looked at me. Hairless dark dog-like figure that did not act like a dog, I can't explain it but it just didn't look possible how it was walking. It felt like my heart stopped working and skipped beats. It slowly backs and prances away on its hairless reversed limbs, I say prance because that's the closest thing I can describe. Frozen it just goes away into some huge bushes and the smell disappears. I just sit there for another 15 minutes on the edge of the dock near the water, completely frozen and flushed. Friends come back. Ask me if I'm okay. I said yes and changed the subject. 
I'm tearing up writing this. I don't know what I saw, but it wasn't a coyote, mountain lion, or a lost dog. Those things don't bring the smell of what I can describe as painful rot. I will never go back there. I now have a fear of off-roading going out in the desert exploring because of this experience. Vegas is cursed I swear. The Pelicans of Lake Eyre. How do they do it, slash x slash. What forces are at play here? Lake Eyre, in the deserts of Central Australia, is the largest lake on the continent. That is, on the rare occasions that it fills. Usually it is nothing more than a dry salt lake. The Lake Eyre Basin has a drainage basin that covers one-sixth of all Australia. It is one of the largest internal drainage systems in the world, and covers roughly 1.2 million square kilometers, including much of inland Queensland, large portions of South Australia and the Northern Territory, and a part of western New South Wales. To provide a sense of scale, the Lake Air Basin is about the size of France, Germany and Italy combined. All the rivers in this vast, flat area lead inland. On those fairly rare occasions when there is sufficient rainfall to make the rivers flow at all, they flow towards Lake Eyre, the lowest point on the continent, at approximately 15 meters below sea level. None of the creeks and rivers in the Lake Eyre Basin are permanent, they flow only after heavy rain, which is a rare event in the arid interior of Australia. Because of the flat terrain, it takes almost a year for water to reach Lake Eyre from the headwaters. Usually, none does, it evaporates or is absorbed into the earth. Only in exceptional years is there sufficient upstream rain to provide a flow into Lake Eyre itself. In flood years, the lake bed fills and for a short time undergoes an amazing period of rapid growth and fertility. Typically a 1.5-meter flood occurs once every few years, and a fill, or near fill, only four times each century. Long dormant marine creatures quickly multiply, weeds and algae suddenly flourish, and fish and crustaceans emerge on a fast breeding cycle. Huge flocks of water birds, numbering in the millions, arrive from around the country to feed and raise their young before the waters evaporate once more. The last notable floods were in 1989 and 1992, each year bringing about 12 cubic kilometers of water into Lake Eyre. But these were dwarfed by the massive 1974 fill, which brought the lake's capacity to almost 40 cubic kilometers. On such a year, the nation's pelicans, which follow no particular schedule of regular movement, flock to Lake Eyre in numbers so great that their absence in coastal areas is unmissable. In fact, the pelican colony that inhabited the lake in 1989 and 90 was estimated to number around 100,000 birds, almost 90% of Australia's total pelican population. They are adventurous and opportunistic birds, trading the comforts of the coast for the harsh outback and the chance of an easy freshwater feed. While the lake was full, the pelicans fledged an estimated 80,000 chicks. The population of Australia's pelicans almost doubled in one year. Once the Great Lake dries again, the population disperses once more, flocks of thousands being seen on the northern coasts and some individuals reaching Christmas Island, Palau and New Zealand. After decades of research, nobody knows how the birds know when Lake Eyre has been flooded, or how they know the way there from their coastal homes, thousands of kilometers away. Adelaide Zoo research scientist Greg Johnston says there is a theory that the pelican breeding colonies act as information centers, each bird passing on information about good feeding grounds. There are other theories too, including birds having the ability to hear sonic vibrations and pick up on waves lapping at the shores and masses of water in creek systems, and magnetic compasses in their brains working on the magnetic forces on Earth. So, let me tell you a story I heard from some friends up north. In the little village of Fife Lake, off of Highway 131 in Michigan, USA, there is a small river. This river goes from Fife Lake to a few of the other lakes in the area, and passes through the numerous miles of forest outside of the towns in that area. In between Mirror Lake and Fife Lake is a particular area of forest where there is a large circular clearing filled with heavy underbrush, marshy soil, and a copse of alder trees in the center. The river runs through this clearing, and goes right past the trees. A generation or so ago, some little girl went wandering in the forest. It was a simpler time, Minecraft YouTubers weren't all over the media. So parents tended to be a little more accepting of things like that. Well, she always went down to the river, 
and told her parents that the river was full of ghosts that talked to her. She said they were little children and animals, and very friendly. Her parents obviously didn't believe her. But maybe, in retrospect, they should have. One autumn evening, she went down to the river like usual. She would always draw pictures of her adventures, and this time was no different, except for one detail. On the picture, aside from the other kids and animals, and herself, she drew a large figure, all black, with a tall hat on his head and a cloak around his shoulders. He had an extended hand, as if to say, come with me, and he was standing right beside the copse of trees in the clearing. The girl never came home that day. In fact, they never even found any remains. The story was that she got kidnapped. One of her friends had followed her, and his testimony shocked the parents and police who heard it so much he was put in the asylum in Traverse City for fear he was delusional, about 25 minutes to the north. He said he watched from the forest as a tall man, strong and old, like a king from a story book, had come out of the alder trees, and had all sorts of small children around him. They were bloated, pale, lifeless, but standing, staring at the little girl. The old man extended one hand, and stood there motionless. She drew a picture on her paper, set it down on the log, and walked over to him. As soon as she touched his hand, he said her body went pale white, and she swelled like a drowning victim, and the old man dragged her back into the copse of trees and disappeared. To this day, that clearing still stands. The little copse is a heavily sheltered area, and you can often see where a homeless person has made a bed there for the night. The number of homeless in the area has dwindled rapidly, and most of the time when drifters come through town, they are only seen until nightfall when they go walking looking for a place to rest. The town tries not to get too attached to people who don't live there, and especially not to parents who bring young children. More than once, a kid has gone off wandering in the woods, only to disappear and never turn up. For some reason, these parents don't ever search, and they almost ignore the fact they ever had a child. They leave town, often wealthier than when they came, and all of them go home and plant a single alder tree in their yard. The only time anyone ever saw the thing one of these people planted, they said the seed looked just like a child's body. I hope that you enjoyed tonight's broadcast. If you enjoyed tonight's story, then please subscribe to the channel as more green texts will appear daily. A new broadcast will appear when the clock strikes. Midnight Central Time.